South Davis Road intersection changes, there are additional maps of the intersection. Um, note that they are not to scale. And under 14.3, add rent eviction bylaw with a staff recommendation. Thank you. With those additions to the agenda, if I can have a motion to approve the agenda as amended, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Patterson. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Moving on, next item is rise and report from the closed session. Uh, the got a few here this evening. The council approved the through road configuration for 1260 Churchill Place as outlined in option A for the staff report dated February 2nd, 2021. Uh, motion CE 2021-039, the council approved R1A multifamily lot layout for 1260 Churchill Place as outlined in option G of the staff report dated February 2nd, 2021. Uh, CE 2021 the council approve rezoning and or preparing a preliminary layout acceptance for our subdivision and sale of 1260 Churchill Place as a turnkey project. And finally, CE 2021 that council direct staff to repair report, prepare a report at a future council meeting, providing more detailed information on preferred options identified by council for road configuration, lot layout, and the subdivision and sale of 1260 Churchill Place. With those, we'll move on to minutes of the regular council meeting held October 5th, 2021. And the recommendation is that council approve the minutes. If there's no errors or omissions, I'll take a motion to adopt. Moved by Councillor Vertan and seconded by Councillor Patterson. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. That takes us quickly down to our delegations. Welcome. Uh, we have Dr. Shelley Cook, Executive Director, presenting the Couch and Housing Association Annual Report. Welcome. Thank you so much. In it's person. A great it's <laughs> quite weird and wonderful at the same time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I just live down the road. Uh, I'm just a very new homeowner in Ladysmith, so I'm very happy to be here in my home community and the okay. chance to present. And I know you have a very full agenda, so I'll do my best to just move through this quickly. I am foresighted and I'm working back and forth, so <laughs> I apologize and my glasses may get steamed up. I'm sure you recognize that with masks. So uh, as indicated, I'm gonna just be running through our uh, annual report that covers um, March uh, 31st, well, April 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2021. Uh, so I certainly can speak to that. Um, you certainly uh, can see the slide, so I won't go into additional detail. So uh, it was quite quite a year. Uh, so to give you a sense of, of what I will be discussing today is just sort of give you a summary of what that looked like. Uh, talk a little bit about our programs, maybe as a reminder for people. Uh, talking a little bit about some regional uh, service housing service highlights. Um, discussion of a COVID-19 task force for vulnerable populations and some of the good work that came out there. Quick review of financials, uh, some housing uh, crisis issues, challenges, needs assessment, emerging issues, and then uh, wrap up with housing policy challenges and some recommendations. And of course, questions, uh, if anyone has any. So again, great privilege to be here and chat with you about the work of the uh, organization over the last year. So what we've seen, March 2020, uh, March 11th, 2020, uh, who declared at World Health Organization COVID-19 a pandemic. So it's obviously the day all of our worlds changed significantly. Uh, we saw an increase, a massive increase in concern for the homeless population, uh, specifically around access to service and the ability to self-isolate within a street homelessness context. Uh, BC Housing, uh, who is our provincial housing authority, came to the table with some funding to create temporary housing for people experiencing homelessness. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about will focus on sort of that end of the housing spectrum because of the concern and the opportunities that presented. Um, Increase, uh, so we had the COVID-19 Task Force for Vulnerable uh, Populations was created and we developed an emergency housing plan. So I'll talk a little bit more about the makeup of that task force in a moment. Uh, we saw increasing, significant increasing numbers uh, around homelessness. Uh, best estimates about 270 people, 300 
uh, on wait lists for about 100 units of supportive housing. Our 2020 point in time count, uh, which is really a snapshot into a window into a homelessness across uh, the Cowichan Valley, identified 129 individuals. So that disparity there is really, again, a lot about the point in time being real snapshot and not necessarily being able to capture all the people that, that really we would consider unhoused. Uh, we also saw during that time a very dramatic rise in housing prices with the average home price jumping 28% in 12 months, 52% um, since uh, 2017. We also saw a 50% increase in the price of condos. So really we're dealing with two sort of dueling pandemics of COVID uh, and the opioid a crisis, uh, overdose crisis, and of course all the housing challenges. So this is just an overview of our programs and certainly the work, some of the work that we're doing to address housing challenges across the CVRD um, and we're doing so in a number of ways. Uh, th on the left side, homelessness prevention um, and so some of our programs there and, and really our emergency response was really really called upon quite significantly over the last year. There was a number of situations um, that, that required it where we provided assistance for people. As an update, we were successful in receiving funding through United Way and Reaching Home, which is federal homelessness dollars, uh, then to uh, provide a housing loss prevention worker. So our, our goal is always to prevent people from being unhoused wherever possible. In terms of our emergency response, moving to the sort of left corner, bottom corner uh, we saw a number of fires um, uh, a couple two significant ones in particular uh, and then the work of the COVID, COVID task force where we uh, were developing what we're talking about as cabin sites or uh, sleeping cabins sleeping units a number of different ways where small little modular houses were used as a really first step in terms of housing people directly off the street and we were also engaged Ramada Hotel um, just sort of quickly running over, I recognize I have limited time, regional housing service, those are two of our main programs. Uh, we also do research and information and a lot of community development work. So we're working on a lot of fronts uh, to address uh, housing concerns within the region. Um, so what we have here is a sort of a summary of some of the work that we did through the Regional Housing Service. I can say that I was absolutely thrilled uh, that uh, we have a Lady, Lady Smith Resource Centre Association was successful in their application as one, our very first um, project out of, the, out of the Rental Housing Capital Contribution Fund. Um, and so I'm sure you've all seen that on and heard lots about it on Buller Road, uh, beautiful, um, beautiful project that we're really happy to support. Uh, so there was actually uh, three approved and two pending for a total of four, 452 new, new, new units through just, you know, that one arm of the project. We also uh, entertained a number of development uh, projects for development funding to help sort of get some ideas off the ground, get traction to explore the feasibility of them. And then we also have an emergency contingency fund uh, and it sort of breaks down the money in terms of how that's allotted to the various programs. Um, so again, that was an really essential funding to help us address the issues related uh, to the fire. Uh, so just some comments about the COVID-19 task force that was uh, local government, all levels of government, local government, provincial, federal, as well as uh, business community and nonprofit organizations coming together to really sort of uh, rally around the house po own unhoused population and, and make uh, whatever opportunities we could realize those opportunities through the funding that was coming through so that outline some of the work that was done. You can see a significant amount of money flowed into our community to address homelessness and it's, it's continuing. And that's our little sleeping cabin, so it gives you a sense of what that looks like. Uh, in terms of our financials, um, and so again, I, I had talked about earlier uh, the, the, the focus and really the opportunity around uh, the funding that was coming to our community, a lot of that to address unhoused people related to concerns around COVID-19. So uh, our total budget was just shy of $2 million, uh, 250 was the Regional Housing Service Fund money. So we, we brought in uh, over, um, yeah, about just over $1.7 uh, $1 million in additional funding to our region uh, over and above the, 
regional housing service funding. So I think that's really important. But it really breaks down. And again, these are opportunities that really materialized during uh, the pandemic. So in terms of um, posing crisis uh, and challenges that we saw, I alluded earlier to just a dramatic uh, increase in the average sale price for single family dwellings, uh, as well as increase in condos. This was having a dramatic impact um, on, on so many people, but most particularly we are hearing from first time home buyers that are finding it incredibly difficult to get into the home, uh, the, the market. Acute rental shortage, uh, rental houses, uh, very, very huge issue of concern identified across the CVRD and prices also escalating, perhaps less so than, um, slightly less so than other communities, but still a significant increase when the demand goes down, sir, or the demand goes up, the, the price so often goes down, or goes up as well. Uh, renovations and renovictions, um, I'm very careful around my language. Uh, but there was a number of renovations uh, that had ended in a lot of renovictions for people. And while we recognize the need uh, to, to improve the standard of older buildings and, and bring them um, up to code and, and ensure that they, they are um, you know, adequate housing, uh, what we're seeing a lot of is older building being turned over, um, being renovated and people displaced in, uh, because of a very high increase in rents that were going uh, going on. So it was a huge concern. So I, I did see the um, the discussion around and rent eviction policy. I think that's fantastic. Uh, we're, we're still left with a bit of questions around the impact of vacation rentals uh, for, for reasons I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, but we are recognizing that vacation rentals are having a significant impact on the availability of uh, long-term housing for people um, and uh, wanting to sort of dig deeper into to what that exactly looks like. Uh, we've also experienced a lot of um, issues, both in terms of access, but also discrimination. Uh, and we saw that particularly in terms of First Nations, youth, and racialized uh, people. Um, and those in receipt of income assistance, which can be an immediate deterrent for landlords. Um, so this is uh, sort of a breakdown in terms of the projections around the housing that's needed for the region. and it's. It's an interesting sort of slide because it really shows that our projections sometimes fall significantly short. You can see uh, that we're, um, it's projected in terms of the couch and attainable housing strategy that we will need 5,000 units by 2025. Um, we're sort of on track to fall behind by a, you know, a good at least 570 units. Um, at this point um, in the first year. So it's something that we're really concerned about. Canadian Rental Housing Index um, indicates that this is sort of what they're projecting our rents to be. We did a bit of a, an analysis by looking online um, and that was done in July and you can see that what current rents are uh, are already exceeding the projections. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult time for people, uh, both in terms of you know, home ownership and rental housing. Um, so some uh, emerging issues uh, that we experienced as an organization, it was a lack of available land for social housing projects uh, in particular. Uh, and so we had, those are three examples of projects where it was, it was absolutely uh, incredibly concerning and, and uh, risking uh, these opportunities because of a lack of available land. And so that's some, uh, an issue of great concern for us at the uh, at Couch and Housing Association. There's workforce housing challenges. I'm increasingly having conversations about uh, people having a hard time recruiting. I can speak to my own experience um, of, of uh, trying to find outreach workers and different people to fill positions for our uh, sleeping cabins and it, it is an incredible challenge. So this is not something that's just hitting kind of just low income people, although all those things tend to have a more detrimental impact on people with low income. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's really starting to have a broad effect across communities. I was having conversations uh, even with do uh, people about doctors being discouraged from coming to our region because of challenges. Um, and so I think there's, there's kind of perception sometimes and the reality of who's experiencing these challenges are a lot broader than people may recognize. 
Um, we're seeing an increase in people living in non-standard housing, uh, couches, vehicles. Well, well, those things always existed. It is becoming um, uh, really increasing rapidly as, as some of those other pressures around cost and availability also rise. Uh, raging, aging rental stock. So this is where you know the two significant fires were concerns and then rent evictions causing displacement and, and really uh, disproportionately impacting low income individuals. And then seeing the end to some COVID specific housing protections that helped um, ensure housing and, and um, ongoing support for some of our most vulnerable populations. So that's obviously a huge issue of concern as well. Um, so just to sort of touch on uh, a couple things, obviously we recognize the importance of policy levers uh, being very um, powerful in terms of helping to sort of realize some affordable housing options. So there's four specific themes. I'll just touch a little bit on, on some areas where we experience some challenge um, and would like to sort of make some recommendations. In terms of land provision and acquisition, I really want to encourage local government uh, to, to, uh, to acquire and, and retain land wherever possible for affordable housing. Um, and, and thinking about pre-zoning land for increased density as well as land trust partnerships. In terms of the preservation of rental housing, uh, it's this issue and again I, I think it's so wonderful to see that uh, discussion around uh, rent eviction policy but to prevent uh, rent evictions wherever possible and require displacement of, uh, pardon me, replacement of any affordable housing units that are lost. We're also encouraging um, a potential business license around um, vacation rentals so we can really get a handle a little bit more on, on what those look like in our region um, and the impact that they may be having. Um, housing market barriers, uh, ensure family friendly housing, lobby for inclusion of the CVRD within the spec, speculation tax region. Um, we are concerned that that's driving people into our area. Uh, for in the search of vacation rentals, second homes and things which is then having some of the effects that negative effects that I've talked about um, and increasing the affordable rental stock. Uh, so there we'd like to encourage fast track affordable housing applications, waiving uh, DCCs for non market housing projects um, and, and really want to encourage people to really stop waging a war on uh, people who are homeless uh, and just to recognize um, that people staying in non-standard housing, it, it's truly because there are no other options and, and we need to be thinking um, compassionately about how to, how to deal with that issue. Um, in terms of just recommendations over and above and again to just underscore some of those things that we find very important and have seen to be very, very helpful. Uh, identify, protect and acquire suitable land for affordable housing. This is where you know, protection policies, zone ready land can be incredibly helpful, especially when opportunities and tens of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars can come to our community if we're able to, to have those things realized. Uh, support a region wide workforce housing strategy and implementation. It's something I know we're talking about with the Economic Development Commission uh, because we're very concerned uh, about sort of just the impact on, on workforce uh, with, with housing being such a huge concern for so many, so many different industries. Um, a relaxation of bylaw enforcement around the non standard housing, as I've talked about earlier. And, and develop a rental, uh, pardon me, vacation rental business license for purposes to better understand its impact on and effects on rental stock. Um, so that is my presentation for tonight. Thank you. I think that was 10 minutes. I don't know. I never know once I start. Oh, no, so pretty good. Okay, that thank was, you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. A lot to cover in a short amount of time, and thank you for providing the slides in advance. I'll turn it over to Council for questions or comments. I've got Councillor Patterson first, then Johnson, then Stevens. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the examples that you pointed out, um, Lewis Street, oh, I gotta put these in, as well as the Ramada Hotel and the cabin sites, and then further on, Drinkwater Road and White Road, those units opening up. They're all in the Duncan Central North Cowichan area. Is Correct. there plans for, other than what the Resources Center is doing, is there plans for having opportunities in the Ladysmith area? 
Uh, absolutely. And so um, I think, again, it was, it was where there was available land and some of this stuff predates my involvement with the organization. But I absolutely, addressing this from a regional perspective, ensuring people's needs can be met in their own community is absolutely integral. And so I think that's something that, again, I just really want to encourage all those opportunities and thinking regionally, which is why working with the CVRD has been really important. Um, and, and ensuring that we're sort of thinking about that regional focus. So absolutely, that is just where those have. And very often it ends up being where services are primarily located. Um, and so that's where they have been. And Councillor Patterson, for clarity, as a member of the task force, um, the alternative to the cabins here on Buller Street was the Islander Hotel. Yeah. So instead of having cabins here, we had the inside space available. Um, but yeah. Good. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Follow up. One for you. Um, just a, as, a, as a new resident, Lady Smith, um, have you had the opportunity of going down Methuen Street to 6th Avenue and looking at the empty property there on the corner that is owned by BC Hydro? <laughs> no, but I have a feeling I might be doing that soon. <laughs> there, is, there is room for probably four duplexes, oh. and if we could get together because Ooh. I'm thinking of a, uh, an organization. So, okay, but I there's uh, beautiful, uh, close to the police station, high school, wonderful. primary school, and it's more of a level walk to town. Wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. Thank and Mr. Olenek's email address is, oh, we'll give it to you after the <laughs> council. <laughs> yes, I will be following up. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Thank you. I have uh, two questions on the slide, uh, COVID task force. 19 task force. One of the bullets says rapid housing incentive to recommission um, $21.9 million for 52 homes. That's 421,000 per house. Is, I'm surprised it would be that high if you're working yeah, on I, well, common I, land and common services that I would think you'd be able to get more houses. Yeah, the unit. cost the cost has certainly increased and is a lot higher than, than uh, certainly much <coughs> experience around some of this stuff uh, but yeah it's coming in a quite a bit higher yeah that's significantly higher yeah, yeah. Th and again so I can get further information on that cost and and that again project predated me uh, it is a fantastic project in a partnership with uh, Cowichan tribes um, but I can get more information as to the dollar value okay and and why so okay. high yeah the other one is in regards to that same area you use the term wraparound support could you just tell me what that is yeah so essentially again you'll hear the term housing first talked about and often it's in um, conjunction with wraparound support so this idea that not everyone needs to be in supportive housing uh, that people can sort of maintain housing and live with supports coming in. So those are not necessarily provided through in reach within their own home, they're provided by outside people coming in. So Sorry. they tend the idea to sort of wrap support around them is the so idea. I don't quite follow you. Are you no. talking about if a person is uh, disabled, the outside support is the wraparound? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be a dis well, and again, I, th I think uh, how we're defining disability, but it just depends on their needs, right? Their support related needs. So some people require sort of a more extreme end where uh, we talk, we'd talk about supportive housing, where they'd have supports on site, there may be a nurse, there could be counseling directly on site, a high level of support, high level of resources right there. And we, f and we find, and again, what research has tell told us, uh, has certainly been my experience over the years, not everyone needs that level of care. People are homeless for a variety of reasons and certainly affordability increasingly being a significant re reason. So wrapping support, community support around an individual wherever they live. Yeah, so this idea that they're getting the services to help them start to, to move beyond their so current situation. Talk? So we're talking about basically the equivalent of long-term care right down to somebody just having a place to live and sleep and move. Is that part of the spectrum? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not sure that I understood your question. Well, in the first part of your explanation, you were yeah. talking about needing full support, care, nurses, et cetera. And that reminds me of like a long-term right. care okay. nursing home. Yeah. So I'm taking what you're saying. There's a spectrum that goes from that right down to Joe Blow, who's just living in a cabin, and he's just living there. 
Mm-hmm. Needs no help. Yeah, so really the idea, and again, you'll hear terms like a sort of community treatment, different models of support, where literally the idea is to sort of wrap support around the individual, and it may not be, um, you know, always uh, maybe the term that may, makes the most sense, but it's one that's commonly used around working with people who may be unsheltered and living on the street and how people are able to then transition off the street or prevent them from becoming homeless. Yeah, I think, Councillor Johnson, because I want to yeah. give others opportunities. No, no, I was just going to say, I was, there, you know, a, thank you. A spectrum, a spectrum is a, a good way to look at it. Some people may just need some mental health support, some intervention, some counseling. Others may need right. drug resources. Others may just need a safe, warm place to get their feet back under them and move on. So Right. Yeah. The, the spectrum then would mean there'd be a spectrum of costs associated also. But anyways, I thank you for the information. Yeah, you're so welcome. Yeah, we thank think you. about it as a continuum. Of, of support. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Stevens. <coughs> Takes a while to get used to the mics again. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for the presentation. I was I was really happy you put up the last slide, or, uh, slide around uh, recommendations. I mm. really think it encompasses or yeah. encapsulates a lot of the, Im- the important things. Um, other things in the report, and it was it's an awesome report to read. I'm, I'm so pleased with it. Uh, the, the points you made about uh, types of housing and I know you're probably going to go to other councils, and there's an empowerment mm-hmm. that you can give to mm-hmm. other councils, and mm-hmm. I think this one too is pointing out that the very the, the moving away from single-family homes, mm-hmm. often councils can take some plaque around different types mm-hmm. of housing, particularly Absolutely. in the case of density, so things like that. Um, this is really, there's a lot of points in here that empower and embolden, I think, to, mm-hmm. to go down that road. Um, and then, of course, the infrastructure argument, where it's lighter infrastructure, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. less requirements for water for the, with that type of housing too. Mm-hmm. So. Um, the, I like really that you've you've really gotten to the stage too that you're talking about the housing crisis across the spectrum. Yeah. Of it's it's the homeless, which is the classic I think CHA mm-hmm. association. Yeah, the most extreme to, end of the to, spectrum. To businesses yeah. approaching you, I know local businesses have approached me about having trouble Absolutely. with with getting staff at what the wage they Absolutely. can pay. Absolutely. And and because of the housing situation, right yeah. up to doctors, which yeah. is the awesome, Absolutely. awesome um, gold standard of of the crisis where mm-hmm. we're at. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. So and I, I guess the final point I'll make. Um, You've, you said you're new to Lady Smith. You might, I don't know whether you're new to the Cowichan Valley. There was certainly a lot of debate around mm-hmm. the housing service. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a big argument around the value you'd mm-hmm. get for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't need any convincing at the time, but I will say, I don't think anyone could could argue now with looking at the leverage, the, the amount of dollars you've mm-hmm. leveraged mm-hmm. to the value for that service. Thank you. Um, and I quite frankly couldn't imagine what COVID would have been like if CHA didn't exist um, in terms of uh, right across the spectrum, as I'm yeah. sa- saying the homeless tri- uh, the yeah. tri- in the traditional sense, but right across mm-hmm. the spectrum of the work mm-hmm. you're doing. So mm-hmm. it's all praise around for me, mm-hmm. um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate those those comments, and I think there is there's a real recognition um, on our part that that housing is and the crisis around housing is much broader than people who are currently unhoused. And so, from my perspective and my passion around it is is finding creative ways um, to to work with municipalities, work with uh, business businesses, landowners to, to realize these opportunities. So I want to thank you so much for your great questions. Thank you. Uh, any other members of council that haven't had an opportunity before I go back for round two? Seeing none, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. One of the key things I got out of you, uh, your report was the, the need for a more rental accommodation. One of the problems with rental accommodation is the government has set limits to uh, annual increases in rent to about one and a half or two percent which doesn't even cover the cost of living what kind of pressure are you putting on the government to uh, maybe reduce that or change that uh, percentage to a more allowable rate so that more people will go into the market to build rental units because nobody basically is wanting to uh, build rental yeah um, yeah, I've had this conversation going back for years when I was chair of the housing committee at the city of Kelowna. Um, and so I recognize that there's there's a cost issue. I, I wouldn't be advocating, quite honestly, for that. I recognize that is can be an issue from a builders and a profit perspective. There isn't. I'd be looking for different ways that we can make that achievable uh, for, for businesses, uh, pardon me, for developers. And so from my perspective, I think that there's lots of other opportunities that we can explore around the creation of rental housing. Um, th- I'm seeing the impact of that extremely high rent and, and how that is displacing people 
And so while I don't begrudge people to be able to sort of create housing and then provide it uh, at the cost that they can, they can provide it at, uh, at the same time I see the negative impacts of, of incredibly high and increasing rents um, and, and keeping pace with any increases that people are getting through any sources of income and, and far outstripping uh, so many of the people that I'm working with. And so I do understand uh, that's a concern. I would be thinking more broadly around how we sort of encourage that in different ways and can provide other measures that will reduce costs that can assist people to create rental housing, including you know, providing them with a capital contribution grant that can help make it more uh, achievable. And follow up. Thank you. My follow up would be, I like the idea of uh, the grants, but when we as a municipal table, we're looking at the yeah. cost we're looking at often mm -hmm. a tax increase of 3%. Mm -hmm. And if the rental increase can only go up 1.5%, um, it's a win-lose proposition. So I like your, some of your suggestions. I'd like to hear more of them. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for that. And I appreciate that there, there's no simple solutions around some of this. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Any other members of council wish to have any questions? Just so you're aware, you are available. If people have questions or ideas, they can contact you. so aware, and I will get back, uh, Councillor Johnson, with some information about that cost yeah. related uh, to the housing and, and why. Yeah. yeah. And again, that may include some things I'm not aware of. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're so welcome. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Cook, and we appreciate you coming tonight, and we will hope to see you again and continued Certainly success well. as we hopefully yeah. emerge from COVID and actually start to make a dent in... Uh, in the dragon that we seem to be chasing around housing. It does feel that way. It does yeah. feel that way. Thank, Thank you. you. So very Have a wonderful much. evening. All right. So we'll move on. Next uh, item on our agenda this evening is development applications. Item 8.1, development variance permit and development permit application for a single detached dwelling at 433 Thetis Drive. Recommendations are three parts. Number one, issue development variance permit 3090-21-10 to increase the maximum permitted height for a single unit dwelling at 433 Thetis Drive. Number two, issue development permit 3060-21-12 for land alteration and construction of a single unit dwelling at 433 Thetis Drive. And number three, authorize the mayor and corporate officer to sign development variance permit 3090-21-10. And over to council. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'll move the three recommendations. Those are moved, seconded by Councillor Vertanen. Discussion. <laughs> Councillor Stevens, I was like, no discussion. <laughs> uh, I was, I was thinking, I, 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 I'll, I'll say some general comments, and hopefully it will spur some discussion. I really was uh, looking to for the wisdom of the crowd here on this one. Um, I, you know, on paper, I have, I, I don't have a problem with this. Uh, in my gut, I have a problem with this, and it's it's, it's one of the, the choices we have to make at, at points. Um, uh, you know, in general, it it does meet the sp uh, the spirit of uh, the OCP. Um, it's it's a large uh, height request, uh, uh, difference in height request, but given the topography, it's it's justified. The street view is, uh, inc you know, doesn't. Um, if you are on the street, it doesn't re really reveal what's going on below the bank. Uh, by the same token, um, if my memory serves, and maybe Councillor Patterson can, uh, was present at the time, I believe in 2008 or 9, um, these lots came looking for a batch variance, I, I think quite similar to this, to deal with the top, uh, topography and a significant um, variance in height. And I, th I believe that at the time it was seen as a, maybe a bridge too far because it was going to create a bunch of houses that were all very tall. Uh, the scenario, I'm wondering if it's death by a thousand cuts now with this house, the first one, it doesn't look that tall and then it becomes somewhat like an Oyster Bay garage. Not a given, but an expectation that variances for all houses along this ridge will, will we're gonna do it and then we'd be looking at, and, and it, it get, comes down to a case of are we ready to live with this? We have, have one letter to the effect of a, of a downhill um, long-term resident who feels they'll be affected by it. Um, those are the things I'm tossing around in my head and I'd like to hear others' feelings on that. It's, it's not so much this house, it's when we have 
12 or 13 of them. <laughs> or the five that are over there, yeah. And, and so um, that's where I'm at mentally. I'd like, I'd like to discuss more things. Uh, before I go to the speakers list, Ms. Hovey, I wonder if I could put you on the spot. Um, as I'm welcome to the table, I should have welcomed you when you came in. Thank you for joining us because you're going to be on the hot spot for this one. Um, having visited the property and looked at the history of development along the low side of Thetis Drive, um, a, a package of variances is almost required, either a height variance or a wall variance to lift the base of the house up to a point where you can build a house without a height variance that would actually, in this case, there's a combination of the two, um, both the, 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 the bottom retention, if you will, and the height, because if I'm correct, it's judged based on the topography of the land and sort of average heights and things. Whereas when you stand on the roadway, what you actually would see is essentially a, you know, a split level, one level dwelling, but it's down the hillside where, or from the low side, like when I viewed the property from Batty Drive, that you would see this large house face, if you will. Um, as a planner looking at lots like this, is there a feasible way to build residences there without some sort of variance being granted? Like I can imagine if it, you go down to grade and you put a building that is within the zoning without a variance, it would actually be below grade from Thetis Drive and require some kind of engineering marvel um, from a driveway to be able to even access the property. Then the property would actually never see the sun because it's on the built into the side of the wall subgrade from the roadway. Um, and, and reading the, the, the concern from the neighbors, um, when I drove up there, I looked up, I went on the top and I looked down, I looked at the houses that were already there and I, and I can't see a way around it that would feasibly build a reasonably enjoyable home for someone. So not to insert my opinions based on what I've seen, but from your professional opinion, is there a way to build on those low side lots without some sort of variance or package of variances like we see today? One that's constructed and shown in the in the picture that was submitted to council. Another one uh, where the building permit was recently approved. Um, in both of those cases, there was no variance required. Um, of course, each lot has its own specific topography, so there there might be slight slight differences. Um, so, but I would say that it is it is possible, if difficult. Thank you. And I had Councillor Mackay next, and then Councillor Patterson. Thank you. Uh, actually, I did a drive-by just prior to the meeting as well, just to go up and have a look at the lay of the land, literally. And I think I have a sense of, there's no street numbers up that I could see, but I have a sense by looking at the, um, the numbers that were there. So um, I certainly saw the two houses that are here, uh, and when I look closely at the picture that we got, sort of this, the extra uh, added one that we got uh, in the handout, uh, page six, I can see that the house appears to perhaps be sitting slightly higher than the other ones, but the pitch of the roof seems less, which I think was one of the details of it as well. So I, 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 and I, and I understand that it looks like a great giant house from the back, but from the street, it's not, from what I can see, it does not appear to be exceptionally bigger or different. It's certainly different styling than the other ones, but I don't see it to be oppressive. I guess perhaps when it's built, it might look different, but by, by the illustrations we see here, I don't see it. Uh, and I understand the concern looking at the house from the back. It's a monster in a way, but I remember uh, driving along the highway and looking up when some of the homes that were built up on the uh, the South Davis Road area were built, and looking up the highway and seeing very close together massive homes from the back, and they just look like bungalows from the front, but they're absolutely massive from the back. So it's not like it's new in Ladysmith. This seems to be a fairly common practice to get great big homes in, and and I have to say that the air, the properties up a hill, up the hill on on Thetis, in my estimations, aren't starter homes. They're, they're fairly luxurious homes with fairly luxurious views. 
and it's understandable why they're looking to make it a big house. So um, while I, I, I'm trying to understand the concerns of the neighbours in terms of it being overly high, but I just don't see how it is going to be a huge obstruction. Any home built on the property at one level, if it, was, if it had a flat surface out, is going to create an obstruction for something immediately across the street, as will any street cause that problem. So I'm not sure I, I see a problem with it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to, um, for uh, Councillor Stevens, from what I can remember way back when, when uh, the initial developer, the request was to put a uh, concrete retaining wall all the way along that whole stretch. So uh, in my opinion, it would look, uh, and it was, I can't remember, 30 feet high or something. So it would look like a, a, a bunker when you landed on the Normandy beaches. And so I wasn't there at that time, yeah. and I wasn't here. But um, so that was the, the uh, uh, issue that the council of the day had, uh, from what I can remember. As far as this goes, you know, uh, driving down there and, and, and driving up, and I, uh, when family come to visit and stuff, I take them up there so they can see the views, et cetera. It, it's, it's phenomenal, except for the hydro line. But driving along uh, Davis Road and stuff and looking up, the houses are set far enough back where I really don't see that there's going to be uh, 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 an impediment to the people down below. Uh, even if it was flat and level, uh, you're going to have a house behind you. And of course, it wouldn't be the three stories because it wouldn't have been that kind of topography. But it's where we live, and uh, it's one of the um, Advent, ad advantages of where we live and one of the disadvantages. Uh, it enhances the view for some. And uh, from Thetis itself, uh, as the report says, it's just uh, slightly over seven meters. And so people building across the street, mind you, they're going up a slope, so there would be no impact there whatsoever. So I, I, uh, I think what has been submitted uh, really covers it all very well, and I don't have an issue with it. Thank you. Councillor Johnson? Thank you. One of the things that's interesting about this particular site is that right behind this is the power lines, which adds another 30 feet of roadway between it and the fences of the other people back there. So it's not ending up in their other people's backyards. The design of it reminds me very much of the houses at Oyster Cove Estates down the waterfront. Those ones are seen by probably more people who are going in and out of the harbor. I know when I do the harbor tours, people look at them and they're just as massive as, as what is shown in these drawings. And they're very similar to the Oyster Cove in the fact that at street level, it's a one level. The, uh, as a result, I don't see a problem. We've got houses that are similar to this already at Oyster Cove. Um, from the road, it's on one floor. And they're taking full advantage of the slope to maximize the value of the uh, the view. So, no, I'd have no problem. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have anyone else on my speakers list. Councillor Mackay, follow. -up. Sorry, just a question through to staff on the um, some of the maps that we got in the staff report, page 54 and 55. It shows um, the um, topography with a right of way running through the bottom of the properties, Ryan Place. Is that ever to be an actual road or is that, I'm not, I don't, there's no evidence of it. I don't know where it begins or ends. Ms. Hovey? To be honest, I don't know the history of that. Um, those lots are one, one lot that goes um, right to the next property, but um, if, yes, Go ahead. So I, I just I, I, I just think it's an important thing for people to know. I suppose if they brought property that there's a, 
right of way through the bottom of their property, which all of these parcels have that. It, yeah, it'd be good to know. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> Have somebody want to speak to that from staff? Yeah. Well, hopefully our planners and building inspectors wouldn't miss it in issuing permits. <laughs> no, thank you. Follow up? Sorry, just, and the reason it came to mind for me was, depending on the size of homes, uh, it's one thing to have 50 meters between the building and the next property, but if there's a statutory right-of-way in the middle of it, somehow the, the road gets put in there, um, then suddenly the property boundaries are quite different in terms of the building. Thank you. Ms. Hovey, did you have a response to that? Uh, thank you. Um, of course, we don't know the future, but um, but there is the hydro right of way and a gas right of way and several other encumbrances on the property that um, make it much more narrow in terms of the actual usable space than is shown on your Google map. So um, that would probably be um, a bit of an impediment to some design Thank you. Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, I guess, a question for staff. On the map on uh, 54 and 55, what uh, Councillor Mackay was just talking about, it shows that the lot goes right across the dedicated road. So, well, no, this is where, uh, yeah, but it goes right across the other side. So, really, if, if the road does go through there uh, nobody would be able to build on the other side so they they wouldn't be obstructed by anything anyways as I see it from this map confused you didn't I okay. <laughs> me too <laughs> so they wouldn't have somebody building right down below them on the other side of the uh, designated road because they still own the piece of property on the other side of the road that's correct okay thank you I was just trying to place the uh, the hydro lines uh, would be right over top of that road right-of-way so I'm wondering if that road dedication was actually tied in with the hydro line right-of-way because it's looking at this map on Google Earth, it looks like the hydro lines are placed directly on that road right of way. So I don't know because Ryan turns into Batty um, in practicality, but there is the offshoot between that connection between the two, um, which is you know marked on Google Maps anyway as Heart Lake Trail, but it's the access to some of our infrastructure as well as the hydro lines. And then if you follow that right of way, it's following the hydro line between Thetis Drive and Batty Drive. So it'd be interesting and probably an exercise for our staff to investigate and either get that road dedication dealt with or see if it's tied somehow to the hydro lines. Um, anyway, without my glasses on, I didn't read that it said Ryan Place. I thought that was the hydro easement, but um, now we know better. But it is following that exact line on Google Maps is the roadway that basically is underneath the hydro line. So. All right, um, any further discussion? Did I miss anybody? Um, uh, Councillor Stevens. I'll just, bring my, I'll just bring my comments back, Mr. Mayor. So I, um, uh, my impression was, and, and from the letters, that given how 1860 defines uh, calculation of height, that uh, the variance, the five meters uh, variance is not everything you'd expect. If this is a flat piece of property, it would be a big ask. If anything, the reduced roof, roof pitch is 
lowering the profile for the upland neighbors, I think, and doing, to the extent you can, building a house across the street, a service to them. Um, one question through to staff, are the staff, the, the pictures on, uh, and it's, it's not to put anyone on the spot, but are, are 425 and 447 Thetis the, um, the houses that were built without variances, or are they, or are they with? Ms. Hovey? Um, there was no electronic file for 447 Thetis because okay. of the age of the house, but okay. um, 425 was built without a variance. Without variance, yeah. No. And yet that ridge is, it's a challenge all the way along, but um, yeah, I think I'm, my comfort is here with, with this design. I understand the challenges of that slope. I know that it varies long, and it doesn't surprise me that some people are able to do it without, without a variance and some require it. So um, I thank Council for the discussion. Hope I didn't make it any longer by starting it. No, you did, but that's fine. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's, it's important that it is as long as it needs to be. Any further discussion? It has been moved and seconded. I'll call the question. All those in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. All right, moving on. Next item is... All right, just finding my page again. Wrong booklet. Bylaws, official community plan and zoning. Thank you, Ms. Hovey. Oh, we have our other planning team member here. Welcome. It's just strange to see everybody in person. I feel like I haven't met any of these people in person. Um, zoning bylaw amendment application for 431 First Avenue. The recommendation is that council give first and second readings to Town of Ladysmith Zoning Bylaw 2014, number 1860, amendment bylaw number 45, 2021, number 2091, and number two, direct staff to proceed with scheduling and notification for a public hearing for bylaw number 2091 as directed, as required under section 4641 of the Local Government Act. Moved by Councillor Jacobson, seconded by Councillor Patterson, open for discussion. Uh, Councillor Mackay and then Patterson. So just, uh, and I'm sure uh, Council have done their due diligence on it, but the, the minutes from the um, um, CPAC, thank you, uh, meeting are included in the agenda uh, later on and um, there was a fair amount of support for this um, project from the CPAC um, and particularly around the enhancement to the appearance of the building, putting on the dormers and such to improve the, the roof line and to uh, continue to build the vitality of the downtown. So that's the point of view from the CPAC. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I agree totally uh, what the owners of the building have done already to date has enhanced our downtown and they've added uh, some more residences down there to uh, have more people downtown and adding even uh, one or two more people I think is, is is good for the community and the building will look that much better so I think it's great. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Councillor Johnson. I just thought about it now, I can't remember re reading it. Um, parking. What allowance for increased parking is there for the uh, residents, and considering we have limited parking downtown? Sorry, what was the question? With the adding this on with another residence, so it'll put a couple more people in, which will mean a couple more cars overnight. Uh, is there being an allotment for parking? There is um, an existing variance that says that no parking um, is required for residential use on that parcel currently. Good, thank you. Thank you. Noting though that there is no parking on the main thoroughfares after 2 a.m. due to cleaning and stuff. So if there was a, a prolific <coughs> problem with street parking overnight, those folks would have to find alternative arrangements <laughs> or pick their car up regularly from the impound after 2 a.m. No parking on First Avenue or the side streets. Yeah, in the alley, yeah. but not on the main yeah. streets. Thank so you. There is yeah. off parking. Yes. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And none opposed, the motion carries. Uh, we're moving on then to committee minutes. Uh, official Community Plan Steering Committee, September 23rd. The recommendation is that council receive for information the minutes of the Official Community Plan 
Oh, thank you as well. <laughs> I'm so out of practice. Just used to seeing everybody on Zoom. Uh, the council received for information the minutes of the official community plan steering committee held September 23rd, 2021. Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Jacobson. Any discussion on those? Just receipt of minutes. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Moving on to 10.2 Community Planning Advisory Committee minutes, which our committee chair, Councillor Mackay, just spoke to. And the recommendation is that Council receive for information the minutes of the October 6, 2021 meeting of the Community Planning Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Mackay, seconded by Councillor Johnson. Any discussion on those? Oh, Councillor Stevens. I'll just say uh, thank you to uh, Councillor Mackay and her committee for uh, examining items before they come to us so that we have a second uh, voice. It's nice to not even have to refer. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. We warm the seat up for you, Mr. Goodall. Next item on our agenda is item 11.1, .1, reprioritization of 2021 water projects. And the recommendations are four points. That council number one, defer the Oyster Bay water main construction project from the 2021 capital plan to the 2022 capital plan and rebudget accordingly. Number two, move the Kitchen Street water main replacement project from 2022 capital plan into the 2021 capital plan at a cost of 165,000 with funds to come from the Oyster Bay water main project. Number three, add the replacement of Park Hill Terrace water main from Neville Street to the end of the street to the 2021 capital plan at estimated cost of $100,000 with funds coming from the water reserve. And number four, amend the 2021 to 2025 financial plan accordingly. Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Jacobs, and discussion. Councillor Patterson. Thank you. Um, item number two, uh, move the Kitchener uh, Water Main Executive Set. Does that leave uh, any funds in the uh, Oyster Bay uh, side of the project? Well, it would be moved to the 2022 budget. Yeah. So it's just basically shifting we're not one project that way and two projects this way. Okay. That's correct. So but we're not. Well, I guess we're we not are depleting it in a way, but this the, year's the only um, real depletion, not really a depletion, is we are adding a hundred thousand dollars here for item number three, and that's mm -hmm. coming out of the reserve. But other than that, there's an, over the two years, there's no change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Thank you. Uh, just uh, uh, I'm all in favor of rechanneling the money to where it can be spent because I think the more we do on the infrastructure uh, replacement and development, the better the money is spent for sure. Um, I'm just curious about, uh, you know, there's not a lot of time left between now and the end of the year, and I'm wondering about uh, the impact for residents in the area. Would they normally have a better lead time into any kind of work like this, and how extensive a disruption will it be to those parts of those streets? Mr. Goodall. Um, through the mayor, the, the way these projects work is they don't go to the end of the year. These projects will actually span into March, um, so it's not as tight a timeline as you think. But saying that, there is significant disruption to the community when we do water main replacement. Very much like the water main replacements that we did last year, there is disruption. The contractors work to um, ensure that everybody gets access, but it is disruptive. Um, the idea that we're trying here is, is we seem to get good pricing when we have a fairly broad timeline for contractors to finish projects and when we do them in the off season. So when we're, instead of doing our construction through the summer, when we do it through the um, winter months, we seem to get a lot better pricing. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. I think we're on to number 12. Nope, number 11.2, Yard Waste Pilot Program, Fall 2021. Recommendation is that Council approve two additional yard waste curbside collection days per route in the fall of 2021 using funding remaining from the 2021 Yard Waste Pilot Project Program budget. Moved by, moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Any discussion? Councillor Stevens. Uh, thank you. I just want to say that uh, people on the street, emails we get, I've all been positive about this program. I really hope we're able to make it work in the longer term. Uh, I'll particularly have two neighbors that are very happy and let me come walk in my driveway without being harassed yeah, for doing this. So um, it's, it's great to see. 
the uptake is is over um, session over session is great to see, and I'd like to see where we go in terms of of uh, stopping you know uh, dumping around neighborhoods at the end of uh, road allowances and things like that as a result of this. So fully in support. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? And none opposed. The motion carries. Moving on to bylaws. How's everybody doing? We're an hour and a bit in. You good? Okay, we'll continue. Moving on to bylaws, item 12.1, amendments to council procedure, bylaw 2009, number 1666. Recommendation is that council give first, second, and third readings to council procedure, bylaw 2009, number 1666, amendment bylaw number 4, 2021, number 2092. Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Vertanen. Discussion? Councillors Johnson and Patterson. Uh, Councillor Johnson and then Patterson. <laughs> Appreciate that, that I'm still the chair of the meeting. Go ahead. I'm not sure where to begin. We're in a public meeting. They're available online. They can access them in person. Or I made that point uh, to her, but she wanted to make me and ask me to specifically bring it up at this meeting and make, make the point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And I would let her know that we're also working on a larger venue that allows for more spacing, more people to access it, and we're just working through the technology supply chain right now that I know all too well to make sure that we can outfit that space appropriately with all of the streaming. She has been informed of that. Okay, great. So she should be pleased then with these developments. Uh, Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, page 96, the last item, um, section 21, remove entire section regarding public hearing procedures. Um, there is... Uh, I understand that there is no requirement to, but just for the public getting their agendas online um, or how are the public notice boards or something, I'm wondering if it would cause more people to question why we're doing such and such public hearing. Uh, maybe this is a uh, uh, question for staff. What do we plan on eliminating? The reasons for the public hearing? It says here there is no hearing. Uh, it limits the flexibility of option. No, so, sorry. Uh, through you, Mayor Stone, to Councillor Patterson. Um, what we're doing, we're going to create a public hearing policy. A draft was presented to the Committee of the Whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and once this bylaw, should it be adopted um, after that time, we'll bring forward the policy, which literally removes the wording or contains the exact wording we're removing from the procedure bylaw and putting it into a policy so it'll be clear guidelines that the public can access um, staff can access council can access so that everybody is aware of our procedure the local government act governs everything else about public hearings good night please go ahead uh, but will every for every meeting if there's a public hearing will it be readily available for the public to on their laptop or whatever when they call up the agenda the explanation will be there it, it will appear exactly as it does now yeah oh okay yeah Super. there's, there's it, it's really just yeah there's challenges when the government does things like bill 10 which amends the local government and the community charter the local government act and when a municipality has it in bylaw they can't respond appropriately to the changes that may be passed in legislation provides more flexibility to the town and the provisions of public hearings are spelled out in the local government act 
So it's just a cleaner, best poli best practices way to approach public hearings. Council procedures bylaws speak to the things that aren't spoken to in either the local government act or the community charter about how we conduct our business here in Lady Smith. Okay, so the public will still get uh, yeah. as best view as possible. Okay. Hopefully front row in a better uh, venue. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, motion carries. Uh, moving on to 12.2, Town of Lady Smith 2022 pers Permissive Tax Exemption Bylaw 2021, number 2084. And the recommendation is that Council adopt Town of Lady Smith 2022 Permissive Tax Exemption Bylaw 2021, number 2084. Hello, Ms. Anderson. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Mackay. Dealer's choice. Any discussion? So just for those who are tuning in late, because this is uh, the adoption of the bylaw, annually this is done looking at community properties um, that are exempted from taxes, either in whole or in part, um, you know, commonly like the church properties, other uh, service properties, etc. Those are included in the bylaw if you wish to view them. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, motion carries. See you again. <laughs> Uh, and a lot over the next several weeks. It's budget time. Yeah, wow. Yippee. Our favorite time of year. Moving on. Bylaw status sheet is there for your information. It's my fun. It's the most fun time of year. Uh, moving on to correspondence. 13.1 Fraternal Order of Eagles. 2101 Ladysmith Eagles Area and Auxiliary. Uh, offered to donate $50,000 to the town to purchase three electronic scoreboards for Aggie Field, Holland Creek Field, and Forest Field. And the recommendation is multi-part. Uh, accept with gratitude the donation of $50,000 from the Ladysmith Eagles FOE Area and Auxiliary for electronic scoreboards at Aggie Field, Holland Creek Field, and Forest Field subject to the following conditions as outlined in the correspondence received October 12, 2021 from Area President Larry Williams. Installation of dedicated signs, dedication signs acknowledging the Eagles donation and the publication of a joint press release announcing the donation and additional press release upon completion of the project. Direct staff to order and install the scoreboards and direct three, direct the mayor on behalf of council to send a letter thanking the Eagles for their generous donation. Moved by Councillor Vertan and seconded by Councillor Jacobson, sure. <laughs> Everybody gets in on the act. Councillors uh, Patterson, then Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it, I think this is absolutely fantastic. Um, again, it shows the, uh, the dedication and commitment of volunteers, and a, a community would not be a community without volunteers. But just a question, I guess, through to staff. If, they, if the Eagles give us the money and we buy the scoreboards, do we not have to go out to a request for proposals or anything? Mr. Barfoot or Ms. McCarrick? I might bring our finance officer in here, but I believe that 75,000 is our, um, our, our purchasing threshold. Um, and these signs would be individual. They may not come from one supplier, so we will get quotes on it. Well, I was just three quotes, I was three quotes on it to, so that we get the best value for that money. I think, thank you. I think it's fantastic. Anyone else? Did uh, oh, Councillor Johnson, right? Yeah, I wrote your name down there. I was trying to skip it. Thank you. I'm just wondering, um, I'm assuming that the town will be responsible for putting in the power and, and putting them up and that stuff. Do we have any idea what that cost for the three would be? Mr. Barfoot. Uh, yes, through the chair. Um, if it down further in the correspondence, you'll see that there's an installation cost of about $18,500. Those will cover the cost. Um, they've built in a contingency of 10% as well. Um, we would be responsible in the, in, to put power to those sites, but th those locations were picked and chosen based on what was already there. Um, so these would complement those sites. Oh. So the net effect is it won't cost us any more, it's already within the budgets. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to new business. I'm taking a deep breath because my blood pressure is rising. Is my face red? <laughs> <laughs> 
Item 14.1, overview of changes of the, that the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure intends to make, as they announced today, to the South Davis Road intersection. So I'm going to I'm going to start on a little bit of a ranty rant, um, but I just want to first of all say I recognize that the the changes being made, um, whether they're termed improvements or not, are going to improve safety for highway access. Full stop. Um, I, <laughs> Mr. Goodall, sorry about that. Um, and our staff have worked really hard over the last two plus years. There's been community members, some of which are here tonight, that have advocated very strongly. Um, and although they may not realize it, at cross purposes at times, many of the neighbors in the area are advocating for absolutely no stoplights, and many of the neighbors have advocated for a controlled intersection. We've had lengthy discussions with the ministry around acceleration and deceleration lanes, egress and access to and from the highway. Uh, access roads um, connected along the highway corridor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. Um, we've met with the ministers, both Trevenna and Fleming, uh, as far back as three and a half years ago and as recently as uh, just about two months ago, I believe, maybe two and a half months ago. Uh, we've had good engagement with the province. Um, I recognize that when we talked about things like a controlled intersection that we had been told for many, many, many years before I was ever elected that that was very unlikely. Um, when you're on the street, you notice it more than when you're driving in your vehicle, but there is a grade there and there are some concerns from a transportation planner's um, perspective of introducing another light there. There's neighborhood concerns about the noise that's created, uh, stopping and starting from a light on grade on us on, on an inclined grade like that um, but all that being said um, I thought that with the push from community members with the push from council from staff that we would come with a more comprehensive package of improvements uh, that I would term improvements to make the intersection both safer more convenient and long term at least have a plan in place that would support our community where we do have growth Councillor Johnson has spoken against um, many of the developments in the South End concerned about the, the traffic that's created. And I will tell you that the uh, most complaints I get about traffic are the Davis Road corridor, and this is only going to exacerbate those things. We've also tried to take leadership on things like climate action, um, accessibility for active transportation. These measures will not improve any of those things. We had a resident, um, I'm not sure if he's here tonight, that wrote us from Baker Road and described his, hello, sir. Nice to see you in person. Thank you for your letter. Um, because now we have a name that, and a face that we can put to the conversations that we've had for the ministry of what the unintended consequences. The first mayor I spoke with when I first got elected was at the AVICC concert. He said, I'm going to tell you, or a concert. It wasn't a concert. It was fun, though, <laughs> especially as a newbie. Conference. He said, beware of the unintended consequences of the decisions you make. Those will often be more impactful than the intentions of your actions when you make decisions as a council or as a mayor. And when we came to these conversations, I felt that it, we were very clear that there were unintended consequences, that when we study these issues, we need to study the full impacts of these issues. And in our most recent meeting, I felt, and I, and I know because I've been on both sides of these tables, sometimes people walk away from meetings hearing what they want to hear. But what I heard out of that meeting from the minister was that all of the uh, consequences of whatever remedial action, improvements, restrictions that would be made at this intersection would be fully looked at before anything was changed. And it's not that I want to preserve the current state of affairs because I think it is quite unsafe and we've had some really tragic intersection uh, uh, happenings there, both fatal and otherwise. Um, and. I recognize this was precipitated from letters from the town spurred on by residents to the ministry asking for improvements to safety at that intersection. So we asked for this. However, I don't think that this is the most comprehensive solution. So I'm going to put Mr. Goodall on the spot at one point and just ask if there's an anticipation on the horizon, uh, and I'm not going to go to you quite yet because I'm going to rant a little bit longer, of uh, any further improvements to the intersection or other accommodations that may approve, improve what looks like the present situation over the long term. Because the description of one of the residents on Baker Road is exactly what I told the ministry. You're going to send people kilometers north 
to turn around, drive kilometres south on municipal roads uh, to accommodate Ministry of Transportation's clients, if you will, putting wear on our infrastructure, increasing traffic on, a, on an already challenging corridor where we have speed issues, where we have concerns from neighbours, uh, where children walk to the school bus every day, um, where children are being transited in cars. I know that you're, you've heard this all before, Jeff, so help me out here. Just stick with me a bit. So I contend that the, 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 the measures being taken in place only address the safety issues on the highway itself and don't actually look at all of the safety implications, the climate implications, the financial implications of the decisions on the residents of Ladysmith or those who use the highway through Ladysmith. If we look at elsewhere, whether it's Couch and Commons, they put a stoplight in to accommodate a shopping centre. Or you look north to Lanceville, they put a stoplight in to accommodate a gas station and a, and a convenience store. However, when we talk about a highway safety improvement here that supports the growth of our community, that justifies the continued growth of com our community in South Ladysmith, the Ministry of Transportation, I don't feel in this case has been here for us. They did look comprehensively at the highway safety issues in themselves and the rationale of their report can be argued makes sense. However, I would contend that if we looked at all of the impacts of this decision, that it hurts our community both in terms of the vitality and livability of it, as well as hurts the both financial and sort of quality of life impacts for many in our community, especially through the Davis Road corridor. So all I'm going to say is that with Council's support, I'll be filing more letters asking for more meetings with both our MLA and the Minister and their staff and continuing to advocate for what I feel would be a better long-term solution to this. But the reality is this is not a decision of Council. We've continued to push back for more than two years, predating actually I believe this Council, going back to the previous Council, to ask for better engagement and, uh, and a better solution. I would also accept that maybe the longer term solution that is more workable and better for the community isn't on the table today, but I'd hope that if the Ministry was going to come forward with these restrictions, they would also make some commitment, whether it's one year, two years or three years down the road, to better long term solutions, including things like access, what kind of metrics would require a um, signalized or controlled intersection, what alternatives are there and when could we expect to have those discussions. Uh, around how to better accommodate traffic through the community. So I'm hoping that Council will, will support me in a motion this evening to write a letter to the Minister and our MLA um, requesting further engagement. Um, but I do recognize that as the Ministry put out the release today, and we did as well following on their release, um, that we were informed of this um, recently in the last couple of weeks. Um, and. Uh, it was shocking to me because I was expecting more conversation because when the minister spoke with us in the summer, um, I felt the commitment was made to look at all of these other things that I mentioned before making any changes. And, and I hope they'll continue to engage with us um, on further improvements to the intersection that improves access and safety and quality of life for everybody in the south end of Ladysmith. Thank you for in indulging me. I can see a few people are tired of me rambling on, so I'll turn it over to others. Please. If anyone wants to speak to it, uh, I'll take you. Councillor Patterson. Uh, I, I was just going to make a motion that uh, the, the mayor, uh, on behalf of council and the citizens of Ladysmith, send a letter to the, the province MOT and um, Mr. Routley stating our displeasure in this uh, concept as well as the lack of uh, honest sit-down discussion on what can be done to make that, that intersection safer. Can we simplify the motion a bit and you just ask the, the just right, because right the I can see Ms. Smith going, that's not a motion. <laughs> there, a lot of the comments at the end there I think are part of the flavor. Um, but if the motion read that the mayor write a letter to the Ministry of Transport, Minister of Transportation and our MLA uh, expressing our concerns with the um, improvements, can we put them in quotes too, um, to the South Davis Road intersection and requesting a uh, follow-up meeting with the minister and staff, I think that would be appropriate. That's what I said. Okay. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Johnson. And back to you, Councillor Patterson. This just shows uh, in the in the time that I've been here, and especially with the 
with the supposedly new and improved highway through through Ladysmith. Uh, this honestly to me shows the um, attitude that highways has for this community because we would not have even the access we have now on the highway if it wasn't for uh, one or two particular uh, uh, councillors at that time. Uh, they totally disregarded the town's uh, request to keep a couple more streets open because of access to the waterfront. They totally disregarded the town's request to lower the speed limit all the way from the Diamond Bridge to... Um, uh, hmm? Road. Yeah. And, uh, you know, actually their plan was to put a freeway in, a four-lane freeway without any trees or anything. Um, a total, total disregard for any input from the community, so this does not surprise me. Uh, I had Councillor Johnson and Councillor Stevens. I'll let you chair for a bit, Rob. Councillor Stevens. <laughs> Through the chair. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, not to belabor the points you've made, they're all excellent ones. The unintended consequences slash throwing under the bus of, of uh, the residents of Baker Road is really disappointing um you know we've got ha three quarter measures would be more acceptable we, we've got barely half measures here why are there no merge lanes if we're even going to um to just do sort of the cheapest and easiest fixes here um it really flies in the face of what you were told by the, the minister this summer i think and that needs to be pointed out and i think if we're and i'm, sh I'm sure you will and in asking for longer term solutions um if we're going to be a two-year time frame on on the, all the improvements or or a five-year time we need to know that timeline and we need to know, we need to know all of the improvements uh, we need some we need some carrots here to, to get us through that time uh, speed limit reductions all the safety measures additional road accesses I would argue a 10-year time frame if that's if that's what we can get out of them uh, I think it's the least we're owed so thank you thank you um, Councillor Johnson you want to be put on the end of the list okay Councillor Mackay must be going to be really good Councillor Johnson uh, I f I'm not disagreeing with anything anyone else on council has said in the mayor's well-placed rant, but I, I just want to emphasize one little piece of it that stands out for me in my glass half full kind of world I live in, <laughs> try to live in. And that is that I, I choose to believe that this is step one in, in, a, in a perhaps a 10 year plan, perhaps a five year plan, whatever it is, but it's step one to create a safer circumstance for the people of Ladysmith. As much as this is a pain in the backside for, for lots of people as well, there's no way of getting around the fact that some of the things that are being changed are to prevent actions that cause very serious accidents. And to take them out of the equation for now is a step in the right direction. And I think I get the frustration, but they have listened to the point that they're taking some action it is not complete ignoring, ignoring of us. And so uh, I know it's not what everybody wanted. We never get to please all the people all the time anyway. <laughs> but I choose to believe that maybe we're going to save some lives in the next couple of years while we wait for the rest of this change. That's it. Thank you. Councillor Johnson, you're up. The problem with the intersection is only going to get worse and worse with the increased population of the South End. With the proposal that they have, it will drive more and more traffic along the Davis Road corridor and subsequently more onto Dogwood, et cetera. I asked for information in regards to population growth of the south of the Holland Creek area. And we received one thing here and looking at it quickly, I can see a pen potentially a couple thousand more cars uh, that will be forced onto Davis Road at various points, and going down to uh, North Davis Road to the, the highway intersection, which has also been uh, the scene of many fatal accidents. And it's not that well designed, especially if we're coming off going to the mall. And we're going to see a lot more people traveling on Dogwood, which is not designed for the, the traffic. So when you are Ne debating and negotiating with the province, we have to emphasize that we are a growing community 
and we are having a lot of additional traffic trickling into the secondary road system, or the primary road system, if you could call it, of our town. And the repercussions of these actions are going to be uh, devastating all along those corridors. Uh, you pointed out the fact that on the Davis Road corridor, you have school children catching buses, etc. We're looking at maybe 800 more homes joining Dogwood, traffic going down to North Davis Road. We're going to look at another 800 to 1,000 homes in the South Davis Road area that can't make a left-hand turn onto the highway. They will be turning that way. We talk about becoming more green. The real world, to me, says that every house that we build there will have at least two cars. In some cases, three. And if they have recreational vehicles, four. We have to have a road infrastructure system that can take us to the highway in a safe manner and get on the highway in a safe manner. Um, I just think that this is a symptom of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem that we as a community are going to have to face is address, address the whole traffic flow system in our community, especially with the new subdivisions coming online above uh, Malone, Malone Road, South Davis Road, and other areas. So it's a, it aggravates a bad problem. We have to address the whole problem, but that is one of the problems. The whole traffic flow system within our community is the bigger problem. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to agree. We should we should hang out after. Um, I, I do want to I do want to ask just for a minor amendment. If I could propose an amendment that Minister Eby be cc'd regarding supporting growth and housing development. That Minister Heyman be cc'd uh, referring to climate action and active transportation initiatives, and that Minister Kalon be cc'd supporting economic development and job growth. Um, I think these measures those small um, have that make that conversation that Councillor Johnson's been bringing forward to the table for this entire term more difficult with our community when we're talking about embracing growth trying to keep up with the demand for housing in our community trying to keep the cost of housing somewhat affordable to some folks anyway um, when supply is part of that conversation and when we go to neighborhoods and we say listen there's another subdivision coming online and it makes people feel uncomfortable much of the conversation is around traffic on that main corridor and i don't think that it's the responsibility of a municipality when there's an access point right there to re be required to support five kilometers of travel within community roads to get people to their jobs it doesn't it's not good for climate it's not good for personal or community finances um, i just believe there's a lot better solution so i just did a councillor patterson did you get the three pieces that i meant before i ranted can i get a seconder for that amendment thank you very much councillor patterson so we're on the amendment now is there any further discussion seeing none i'll call the question on the amendment all those in favor any opposed none opposed and on the motion as amended any further discussion none all those in favor any opposed none opposed the motion carries finally before we move on i want to thank uh, members of our audience tonight although i think at times i read facebook posts um, I think that maybe you think that we're not on the same team sometimes, but we very much are. And I do appreciate your advocacy, especially to the province, uh, when it comes to these issues, because it does give us the opportunity to show that it's not just us from the council table bringing these concerns forward, but actually spurred on by the concerns of our community members, who we're all supposed to be trying to jointly serve, and that's all of you. All right, moving on then, we'll move to item 14.2, Fire Smart Community Funding and Supports Grant 2022. We'll let Mr. Geiger get the seat first. <laughs> Hello, Chief. All right, uh, the recommendation that Councilor Johnson's already moved is that Council authorize the Couch and Valley Regional District on behalf of the Town of Ladysmith to apply for a Fire Smart Community Funding and Supports Grant up to 325,000 and if successful, receive the funds and manage the program moved by councillor johnson seconded by councillor stevens any discussion uh councillor johnson and stevens this time 
through the chair to the fire chief on this grant program how much money this do you see in regards to projects relating to our immediate area uh go ahead chief i can say most of the discussion at the cvrd is why is all this money going to ladysmith um but you you can provide us with your perspective uh i i'm not sure i have exact numbers uh there was a significant portion yeah so there was a, a position for fire smart coordinator um and some uh fuel prescriptions and remediation so i think the total oh man i'd be way out on a limb on that one yeah i wouldn't I, I i wouldn't think it was fair because really once you get the grant then they'll put a finer point on the program but i will say that this is a, a series of grants that we've been successful in to a varying degrees over the last couple of years around emergency preparedness in this portion of the grant there is significant uh, investment in the lady smith sort of area h area g area surrounding lady smith councillor johnson follow-up the reason i was asking is because we are building more and more uh housing in such close proximity to the forest and considering the uh, abnormal heat that we are being experienced uh, we need something desperately in our community to uh, develop strategies plans etc yeah, that's sure. why i fully support the program thank you uh councillor stevens thank you yeah i'm excited to see this um uh, mount hayes it made it real this summer very much for us uh, i know this isn't everything that we're going to need but it's a tremendous first step i think thank okay. you any further discussion seeing none all those in favor any opposed none opposed motion carries Ms. Smith, does that take us to the end of our agenda? Uh, no, we have the additional item uh, renovation oh, right, bylaw. Sorry. I don't have that on my actual paper copy, so I'll go back to. Oh, it's on the front page of the late items. There we go. All right, so this is 14.3 renovation bylaw, and the recommendation is that council direct staff to prepare a renovation bylaw for council's consideration. Uh, moved by Councillor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Vertanen and everyone else around the table, and we'll have some discussion. <laughs> Councillor Jacobson and then Johnson. Um, I was just thinking that maybe it might be um, better to come to Committee of the Whole before it comes back to Council just for more in depth discussion. Any bylaw? Uh, through the staff, uh, opinions on that? Is there just a concern about timing or? Um, uh, through the chair, uh, that is correct. A committee of the whole process would slow down the adoption of the bylaw, um, which would mean that some uh, landlords could possibly avoid um, the bylaw by executing their plans prior to its adoption. Uh, we can structure the report to council with the bylaw so that the bylaw can be easily amended by council. Um, we can uh, set it up so that council can make um, and we'll draft and structure the bylaws so that council could essentially have some plan. options to plug in. Okay. Okay, follow up? Okay. So I would suggest that when the item comes back to council, we'll give, you know, I'll provide some latitude to council to have a bit of a more free form discussion, and staff should be prepared to sort of participate in that discussion. And if you're able to, Mr. Bella Babo, with your staff and team, um, provide for that flexibility with some plug-in modules, if you will, that council can work through. Um, that would make the process uh, support a, an in-depth discussion, but also um, some expediency in the process. Uh, sorry, I didn't, uh, I, I, saw, I saw Councillor Johnson, Councillor Stevens, and Councillor Patterson, but I did see Councillor Stevens first. Uh, it's been partially answered, but it, it strikes, am I correct, that this is not going to be a a 30 page bylaw it's going to be small enough to do exactly what you've just described in terms of amendments and modules is that is that something staff can guess at either? through the staff uh, through the chair uh, it will have to be quite a fairly substantially sized bylaw but it will be parsed from other bylaws um, also much of the content will be fairly um, rudimentary and straightforward council's not likely to want to change it, um, it Obviously, any bylaw has a lot of preamble, a lot of definitions, things that are essentially necessary for the mechanics. 
um, we can, and the, the main sort of substance of the rent eviction regulations would likely be contained on a single page or two pages. Thank you. Councillor Johnson and then Patterson. So all I see here is direct to uh, prepare motion on renovation, uh, rent, rent evictions. I don't know the definition of the word. Well, what are we actually, I have an idea what we're talking about, but what is the in actual intent of this? Is it the uh, baby apartments situation? Uh, Obviously, there's a, a timeline uh, on that one that's important to the various individuals, but I would like to have, what is rental vision? There's an endemic issue across the province right now of buildings being renovated and then uh, extremely cr creating uh, increased rents and then flipping them into either higher rental or condo units. Um, and there's some concern that this is happening throughout the province, including in Lady Smith, and there's an opportunity to uh, address it before it gets out of hand, like other communities done. In fact, I would say we're quite tardy on this issue. Um, we're probably a little bit behind in terms of getting something like this on the table. If you're not quite clear on it, count staff can come prepared after this direction is given to inform council and perhaps maybe provide a bit of a presentation to council on the, the what rent evictions are and maybe some of the elements of it prior to the discussion of the bylaw uh, and that will inform community members and council about uh, what it is that we're really dealing with. Yeah, that's the intent of my motion is to get, yep. or my question is to get that through because there are some capitalists that would disagree with the situation. Thank you. And there's many, many people being pushed into their cars and on the streets that would probably disagree as well. Right. All right. Any further discussion? Councillor Patterson. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, a, a couple of, uh, I guess one is a comment, is there is other municipalities out there that do have uh, these bylaws, so I would hope that staff would be able to glean through those fairly quickly and, and have something back to us. Um, as soon as they can uh, but secondly once the word gets out there and hopefully not but do we have a way of stopping um, people that want to jump the gun before this is enacted mr bell about uh, through the chair uh, just a comment on the first point yes we will be uh, using another municipality's bylaw as a template so that will make the drafting process very fast um, on the second question um, yes there's a number of steps uh, the residential tenancy branch uh, the residential tenancy act I should say was amended to address rent evictions to some degree um, and so that means that if um, a landlord were to see that uh, this bylaw would be tabled, is to be tabled and considered, um, they ha still have to go through a number of steps, uh, significant steps, to um, be able to evict people before the bylaw comes into force. Uh, this bylaw can be adopted in as quickly as two council meetings. Um, so there is a good chance that if we're fortunate and are able to bring it forward fast enough that um, many landlords would simply not be able to get through the residential tenancy process um, to execute a rent eviction um, before the bylaw comes into force. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Oh, Councillor Jacobson. Just a follow up to bring this back to um, my hope that we would bring this to the committee of the whole first we have a meeting on november the 9th would that give staff enough time to prepare um if it and then we have two council meetings one on the 16th and then one again on december the 7th so it sounds like um i mean the level of red tape that somebody would need to go through um, if this is what they were intending to do they probably wouldn't be able to get through it within the next what eight weeks not even so uh, before I go to mr. Bella Baba I recognize and then that timeline you just mentioned the first meeting is a council meeting it would be up to council if we felt at that meeting where the bylaw options are presented if we wanted to continue to discuss it at committee of the whole um, but mr. Bella Baba if uh, we may actually be able to work with those uh, timelines through the chair uh, if uh, I think our plan we've already missed the cutoff for the November 2nd meeting so 
that would mean the 16th meeting would be the first meeting that we could introduce the bylaw. Um, so presumably we could actually have it on the agenda for the committee of the whole on the 9th. Okay. Um, so it may actually work. Um, I'll work with legislative services and we'll see if we can um, make that work. So we do have a motion on the floor. Uh, would an amendment be in order that, um, because you're saying basically that for the next council meeting it's too late. So really the first opportunity for council to discuss this would be at that committee the whole meeting. Uh, yeah, it would appear so. Um, I don't see a need to amend the resolution because it's simply to bring a, by a bylaw back to council so staff usually make the choice as to whether to present it to committee. So if I, if I could suggest then that maybe a bit of a presentation just kind of going through it be brought to the committee of the whole meeting with where the bylaw is at that time. Mm -hmm. And then that gives the opportunity to have the discussion at committee of the whole and then move to the bylaw in council. Thank you. And then maybe to address Councillor Johnson's concerns about the presentation and, and just digging a little deeper into what this actually looks like so that we can make an informed decision on, on the scope of this bylaw. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Uh, Ms. Smith takes us to question period. I sorry, I started packing up. I thought because everybody walked out, I thought the meeting was over. <laughs> that through to staff you can answer offline that's not a question for council at this time So I think that's been spoken to at length. Perhaps that question was asked because he's unable to see the meeting. Um, and I think, you know, I can follow up with him as well, but this is not a decision of council. There's no authority of council here or else the likelihood the changes would be different. Um, but uh, in the case of what it is, um, the ministry has announced today they're moving ahead with the changes. Uh, specific timelines, I don't know, but perhaps we can find out what their best estimates are and I can inform him. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, we'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Stevens, seconded by Councillor Mackay. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you all.